Your attention and I welcome you uh, once again to the Monday Comparative Literature Luncheon Lecture Series. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. Uh, the first one is our speaker next week, Monday, October 16th, will be um, Adriana Johnson from the University of California, Irvine, and her topic will be Infrastructures of Water and Visuality, Thinking with Sleep Dealer and Ariel Movie. I have no idea what that is. So I'm going to come on Monday and find out. All right. Second announcement is this Wednesday, there will be another trivia night for compared to, for actually for any liberal arts uh, students and faculty, but it's sponsored and set up by the Department of Comparative Literature. Uh, so Wednesday, November 11th, starts at 7.30 p.m. at Webster's Bookstore downtown. Uh, the event is open to all students and faculty in comparative, uh, in, in, sorry, in the College of the Liberal Arts. And so the trivia questions will be related to liberal arts types of topics. Um, they're played with teams. Uh, there are five people on a team, and you can just sign up for a team when you show up. So uh, you all you do is show up at 7.30 at Webster's, and you'll be on a team, and uh, there will be a special prize for the winners. I know uh, Tom and I did this last year. We, we run the same team in the trivia, and we didn't win either. But we lost miserably. We didn't do very well. It was a good question. <laughs> but, you know. So, everyone is invited to that. Um, all right, so today's uh, speaker, now Andrew Singer, is a poet and an instructor, literary translator, and editor. So, he's got a lot, he wears a lot of hats. Uh, he's been teaching courses at Penn State in creative writing, literary translation, and European literatures. And he also directs the Traffica Europe which showcases new fiction and poetry in English translation uh, from across the 47 Council of European countries. Now, Traffica Europe features an online quarterly journal, events calendar, online European bookshop, animated literary videos, audio interviews, and essays, and is preparing to launch Traffica Europe Radio, which will be Europe's literary radio station online based at Penn State. Uh, if we have any students who are interested in uh, uh, participating in a uh, internship with Traffica Europe uh, next semester, please uh, contact Andrew. And that's Traffica, by the way, with a K. All right. So if you want to look that up, and if you're interested in uh, doing an internship for credit. Um, so um, uh, Mr. Singer uh, mentored as a poet with Derek Walcott for three years at Boston University, and this is during the time when Walcott uh, received the Nobel Prize for Literature. So this first-hand perspective on the importance of Walcott's work forms the basis of Andrew's talk today, which is entitled, Derek Walcott and the Expansion of English Language Poetry. So please join me in welcoming Andrew Singer. Companion in Rome, whom Rome makes old as Rome. Old as that peeling fresco, whose flaking paint is the clouds. You are crouched in some ancient pensione, where the only new thing is paper, like young Jerome with his rock vault. Tom Seward, you're muttering a line that your exiled country will soon learn by heart to a flaking sunlit ledge where a pigeon gurgles. Midsummer's furnace casts everything in bronze. Traffic flows in slow coils like the doors of a baptistry. And even the kitten's eyes blaze with Byzantine icons. That old woman in black, unwrinkling your sheet with a palm. Her home is Rome. Its history is her house. Every Caesar's life has shrunk to a candle's column in her saucer. Salt cleans their blood-stained togas. She stacks up the popes like towels in cathedral drawers. Now in her stone kitchen, under the domes of onions, she slices a light, as thick as cheese, into epochs. Her kitchen wall flakes like an atlas, where, 
once Ibra Draconis was written, where unchristened cannibals gnawed on the dry heads of coconuts as Ugolino did. Hell's hearth is as cold as Pompeii's. We're punished by bells, as gentle as lilies. Luck to your Roman elegies, that the honey of time will riddle like those of Ovid. Corals up to their windows in sand are my sacred domes. Gulls circling a sen are the pigeons of my St. Mark's. Silver legions of mackerel race through our catacombs. That's from Derek Walcott's Midsummer. It was uh, one of the last things he wrote before starting out on Omeros. I believe this was in the mid-80s that this came out. And um, we only have a few minutes here to give you a taste of Derek Walcott's oeuvre. Um, I might ask, just to start out so I have a perspective on who I'm talking to, how many people have a, feel you have a substantial familiarity with Derek Walcott's work, or how many, let's make it more concrete, how many of you have read Omeros, mostly or all? Okay, that, that's uh, useful. Um, I could talk here for hours, in fact, I'm, I hope it goes long because I'm loaded up with liquids from these guys. I've got, I've got coffee and water and coconut water. Um, speaking of coconut, um, and by the way, this this coconut water is okay. If you're looking for really good coconut water, um, I can recommend Harmless Harvest organic coconut water, which is divine. It's terrific, incredible. And there's a new one, um, Coco Community organic coconut water, which is also terrific if you're trying to catch this coconut water craze. That's. That's an unscripted plug, but uh, I just want to say I'm uh, craving coconut water these days. I don't know why. Maybe it's the potassium or something. Um, Derek Walcott was my teacher for poetry, as you mentioned in the introduction. So I'm not here today to talk to you as an academic. I, I mean, uh, you're not going to hear too much from me today about uh, interjacence and the individuation of the uh, West Indies, you know, all of that. Uh, you can look elsewhere for that. There's a lot of that out there. Um, but my experience of Derek Walcott is rather direct as a poet. And so I want to speak of my experience of him um, and, and what I feel his poetry means or can mean for all of us. And that's a, that's a kind of a tall order to handle in 21 minutes or so. Mostly, I think the time would be best spent by my simply reading to you from Derek Walcott. I think if I did nothing else and used none of my own words, um, that would be time well spent. But you'd feel cheated out of a, out of a talk. So I'll share some, some observations, some reminiscences, and, and perhaps some more work from Derek in this brief time. And then we'll have an ample question and answer period where I'm happy to expand on any of that which is of value for you or to try to address any of your questions in my limited capacity as a poet and not as a scholar of, of Derek Walcott. Anyway, um, I met Derek in the autumn of 1987 when I began my master's in poetry. Um, the, uh, you know, uh, the English bardic system for uh, studying poetry that we've inherited from the Middle Ages, uh, I think uh, Milton specified that it was 12 years of uh, rigorous study to become a poet. I went into a one-year master's program in 1987, and I came out in 2000. So that was something like 12 and a half years, which I, which I did a one-year master's in poetry. So I feel like I've been through the Miltonic Mill a little bit of that experience. Um, I, I went in as a, as a boy with a notebook, thinking it was ludicrous to study poetry for a degree. You know, I, 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 I didn't want to take it seriously, but I had no better ideas in mind. In fact, I was quite passionate about poetry, but I didn't uh, think that there would be any value in, in taking a course in it. And I, I left that program totally transformed as a writer and as a, as a human being. And I've, I think it was the best thing I could have done with my life, and Derek Walcott was a, was a big part of that. And I don't want to, um, just as I don't want to give a dry academic talk about Derek's work and its significance, I don't want to make the mistake of erring on the side of, of uh, the poet and being hyperbolic and in the extreme. Um, 
we met a lot of poets in that program when I was studying with Derek. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I began to understand that poets tend to be hyperbolic. For example, we met Tom Gunn, and uh, he told us uh, that he annihilates the universe at the end of each line of poetry and recreates it at the beginning of the next line. And uh, I asked him about that after this uh, meeting with them. Derek had chaired this meeting just for us. And uh, afterward, I went up to Tom Gunn and I said, do you really annihilate the universe at the end of each line of poetry and recreate it at the beginning of the next? He kind of scowled at me and said, it's a sort of metaphor. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't want to make the mistake of um, being too hyperbolic. But I don't think it's possible to overestimate the, the value of what Derek Walcott has given us. Uh, and I've spent decades since then mulling over this. And I, 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 I just, the astonishment has not receded one bit, you know. I'm, I'm staggered by this uh, achievement and what it means for us. So let me try to sort of make sense for myself of that. Um, Derek Walcott wrote Omeros and then won the Nobel Prize immediately after, in 1992. And Omeros is a work in fully formed hexameter, uh, some several hundred pages long, with the complex history of uh, his island nation of Santa Lucia, fabulated in different characters and perspectives, um, by transposing the Homeric myths to the Caribbean. And um, so Achilles is a fisherman, there he's named Achille. Uh, Hector drives a transport from the airport. Helen uh, is a black waitress part-time on the beach. Um, and in like manner, the Homeric uh, mythology is totally transposed to a history-less Caribbean. Um, in, in the sense that the Caribbean has the sea and the light um, and a great deal of intermixing of histories and races and um, some great unknowns at the edges of that, stretching backward. Omeros explores all of that quite systematically, in fact, starting with the island life, but then going back to the Dutch history, stretching back to the 1700s, Going back to the English history, there's an English major on the island and his wife who are left over from the colonial times. Um, if I remember rightly, Santa Lucia was um, declared independent around 1964. But Derek Walcott had a proper uh, high British education uh, as it was a British colony when he was growing up there. So he's inherited a complex set of histories and perspectives. Um, and it's an exciting time when the island gains its liberation and when all of uh, the Western humanity is undergoing a period of decolonization and uh, introspection and, and seeking ways to step forward. I think that what Derek has given us is a way to step forward and I think we aren't even at the, scarcely now, at the leading edge of assimilating what this, what this gift is for us. Um, so that may sound hyperbolic, but as a poet, I feel like he has expanded the possibilities of English verse. Um, this is not a new concept. Um, several great people have co-opted this idea. I'm sure T.S. Eliot, for example, has, has, has observed this about different poets through the ages. We can say that Shakespeare expanded the possibilities of English verse by mastering it on its own terms, its own London high literature, literary terms from the countryside. So he was able to include the speech the perspectives, the folklore, uh, and so on, of uh, people from the countryside. Yeats expanded the possibilities of English verse further um, by including Irish concerns, Irish perspective, Irish politics, um, Irish mysticism, and so on. We can say that Derek has expanded the possibilities of English verse now to include the former colonies, if you will, or let's say, for a shorthand, uh, the world. Um, I believe that along with other major poets of his day, they consciously strove towards something instinctively, that they supported each other and that they achieved level by level, layer by layer, um, this new um, this new form of verse. I, I hesitate to, to say new form because, for example, Omeros was written in hexameters, 
but it took a very, 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 very long time before someone could successfully write something like this in hexameters, and I think there's a good reason for that. Um, hexameters have not had such a glorious time in English language. Um, when English was first becoming an international world language, um, and people were trying to translate Virgil and the Aeneid and all of this in the 1500s, you see Surrey experimenting and settling on sort of blank hexameters or something like this, uh, and then it kind of dies away. Then when the great promise of the Americas uh, pops up and there's this untraveled landscape and where poets are looking for voices to match this expansiveness, Longfellow rediscovered hexameters and he did okay with it, frankly. Evangeline uh, works, you can read it, it's, it's natural rhythm in hexameters, which is pretty unusual. But for the most part, hexameter is a long, bulky line. It's not suitable to English iambics and uh, natural speech patterns, and it's just too long for English thought or something. Um, so we haven't really succeeded in it. I think that Omeros needed to be an hexameters, and I think that it has flushed out hexameters for a new age of poetry and a new age of the world in ways that we couldn't have anticipated. I think the reason why hexameters work in Omeros is because Derek is doing so much in the verse. Um, there's, a, there's a terrific scholarly work on Derek's Caribbean period by Patricia Ismont, um, in which she observes that everything, that, that sim in simultaneity in a line of Derek's work or in a verse of Derek's work, you have um, several modes. You have the meditative, you have the lyric, and you have the, um, the visual. I would add to that in Omeros, in every single stanza, you've also got this incredible sense of history behind every object, every rock, every street, every person. You've got the psychology of the characters interacting. You've got the sociology, you've got the politics, you've got the compassion and the empathy and the incredible sense of community and a staggering, staggering, pervasive sense of light throughout. Um, Derek was very lucky to have inherited, to have been born in the Caribbean and inherited that tradition of light. Um, in the English poetic tradition, there's a lot of light, but in the, in the, in the line from, uh, from, from medieval poetics, light is generally speaking a metaphysical concept, a religious concept or a, a way of transmitting wisdom or, or what have you, you know. Um, in Derek Walcott's work, it's light. It's actual light. I mean, it's, it's flooded. It's, it's a zinc sun, which is just s smashing down continual, staggering amounts of light on everything. It is so amazingly etched, so amazingly visual, um, so dense with physicality, with sensuality, uh, but above all, this, this sense of light, <coughs> the motion of light you know, over a series of lines. You'll, 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 You'll observe the sun moving, you'll see the shadows growing and, and shrinking, you'll see the relations of objects changing. I mean, um, in a way, if you want to look at the progression of light in poetry from medieval times to, to, to poets like Walcott, it's almost like we are bringing the world up to the level uh, that was reserved for, for the, the metaphysical before, where he's bringing us a poetic world that is light-filled, but it's the real world now. It's not a metaphor, it's not a concept of light or something like this. Um, it's quite physical, as if the world is growing up to that light. And so too, because of the complexity of, uh, as I say, everything that he's doing in every stanza, especially from Omeros forward, especially in Omeros, um, you need, you can use, you, you have the possibility to fill a line of hexameter whereas we didn't have that before because it is so complex, but also so, the machinery of it is so condensed that hexameter is actually suitable because he wants to express all of these things in the simultaneity, the history, the psychology, the compassion, the, 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 the visuality. Um, also because he's a playwright, the blocking out the motion, the scenes, you know, um, it's very, it, there's a lot of physicality in that sense as well. Derek made his living as a uh, playwright, at least until he won the Nobel Prize. And um, like the other poets that I mentioned in that sequence, Shakespeare, Yeats, 
who expanded the possibilities of English verse, they were also writing verse theater. And Derek Walcott also wrote a lot of verse theater. I think that what he has done has not been in a vacuum. It's not been isolated. But he's, he's one of a group of, but let's stick with poetry for the moment, a group of poets in the late 20th century who, buoyed by each other's achievements and working together or in parallel or with each other, aware of each other, um, really seeded this new possibility for, for English verse. Um, I would include the Nobel Prize winning club for sure. So I'm talking about his, his, his fellow poets, Seamus Heaney, uh, Joseph Brodsky, Chesel Miwaj for sure. Let's, let's stick with those three for the moment. And, and Derek Walcott, they all knew each other, of course. They were all reasonably friends. Uh, Derek and Joseph were the best of friends. I mean, they were best friends of each other. And they really had a great influence on each other's work right from when Joseph came to the US. Um, you see in Joseph Brodsky's work a tremendous change when he switches to English when he comes to the US. You see him finding an almost fractal brilliance in the way he encodes information into his lines once he reaches English. He's, he's in a whole new um, stratosphere. And um, he and Derek played very well in several stages uh, with those kinds of developments on <coughs> each other. Um, and they were, they were terrific with those friends. Um, but also coming to the US and invigorating U.S. poetry from above were other um, immigrants, other uh, exiles, if you will. We can't really call Seamus Heaney an exile, but anyway, he spent a lot of time in the U.S. He taught at Harvard, um, where Derek was, and, and Derek was later at Boston University, still in Boston. Um, Jess Olney Walsh coming from Lithuanian Poland and bringing his concern perspective, and especially Brodsky bringing his exile's um, uh, concerns, but also his tremendous um, depth of culture and his, his magisterial way of expressing it. Um, I think he and Derek shared that uh, to a great extent. Um, reinvigorated the possibilities of English verse, and working together, I really do believe that they have laid down something which is so far bridging above our current uh, popular, easily accessible culture that we have yet to assimilate what they have done. And Derek, especially for that, you can open to almost any page of Derek's work, like you could with Virgil, and find, um, you know, uh, luminescence and, and uh, enlightenment. I mean, it's, it's uh, I don't think we've had such an achievement in the last 200 years or so in poetry. I really don't. Um, Derek was exquisitely cognizant of what he was doing. He was not um, simply an artist poet, you know, but he was, he was quite aware of the complexities of black and white, of rich and poor, of colonized and empire, uh, and the many other big topic issues that we're living through in these decades. And he let them sit very, very, very slowly and churn through them over decades and, and made of them something tremendously lasting. And he was as equally articulate talking about what he was doing as he was doing it. So for example, I'll just read a passage to you from his uh, Nobel lecture. If you haven't read or heard uh, Derek Walcott's Nobel lecture, then don't waste your time sitting here. Just go out now to the library and have a look. Oh, this thing has logged me out again. Hold on. Um, I think I have a cup that went here. Just a second. paragraph before this one, but this is what I have here. Anyway, this is from Derek Walcott's Nobel acceptance speech in 92. Uh, <coughs> Break of Oz and the love that reassembles the fragments is stronger than that love which took its symmetry for granted when it was whole. The glue that fits the pieces is the ceiling of its original shape. It is such a love that reassembles our African and Asiatic fragments, the cracked heirlooms whose restoration shows its white scars, this gathering of broken pieces is the care and pain of the Antilles. And if the pieces are disparate, ill-fitting, they contain more pain than their original sculpture. Those icons and sacred vessels taken for granted in their ancestral places. Antillean art is the restoration of our shattered histories, our shards of vocabulary, 
our archipelago becoming the synonym for pieces broken off from the original continent. And this is the exact process of the making of poetry, or what should be called not its making, but its remaking. It's the fragmented memory, the armature that frames the god. Even the rite that surrenders it to a final pyre, the god assembled, cane by cane, reed by weaving reed, line by plated line, as the artisans of Felicity would erect his holy echo. Felicity is a town in Sacrilegia. Poetry, which is perfection's sweat, but which must seem as fresh as the raindrops on a statue's brow, combines the natural and the marmoreal. The marmoreal marmoreal means made of marble. I had to look that up. Um, it conjugates both tenses simultaneously, the past and the present. If the past is the sculpture and the present the beads of dew or rain on the forehead of the past, there is the buried language and there is the individual vocabulary. And the process of poetry is one of excavation and of self-discovery. Deprived of their, I'm skipping a bit, deprived of their original language, the captured and indentured tribes create their own creating and secreting fragments of an old and epic vocabulary from Asia and from Africa, but to an ancestral and ecstatic rhythm in the blood that cannot be subdued by slavery or indenture, while nouns are renamed and given names of places accepted, like Felicity Village or Choisy, um, and so on and so on. Um, it's an amazing uh, testament to the value of what he was doing, and uh, I believe what he achieved. And the fact that Omeros is 300 lines of natural hexameter, I mean, you can say it, it has, it has a natural language component to it, um, shows, I believe, that we as a culture, I mean, uh, as a world culture, as a, as a species, as a, as, a, as, a, as a thinking species, have achieved such a level of complexity, openness, and compassion that hexameter can is now suitable again for containing this this larger sense of ourselves and our place and our environment. And so now it, it, it took me two years to read Omeros. I couldn't take it. Um, I, I had it on my shelf, I would take it down, I would read one and a half pages, and I would be so flooded with inspiration and light that I couldn't read further. I had to close it and put it back on the shelf. It took me uh, maybe a year and a half, maybe two years to read. But now when I go back to it, um, there's, a, um, there's a timelessness in that craft. It's something that speaks so far into the future that it almost makes everything else that we're doing pale by comparison. Um, and, and I mean that in both the liter to literal and the figurative sense. And um, uh, maybe I'll just uh, share one passage of Omeros, and then we'll uh, open it up to any discussion. But now I do have to log it, so we can just this. Uh, so the time goes very fast. I will just um, share a little bit. And, um, you know, uh, the Nobel Prize winner was just uh, named, what, four days ago, something like this, um, Ishiguro. And uh, one of the first things he uh, said, that, you know, he was asked about his, um, his relation to uh, being English. You know, he's English, but he's from a colony from India. And he said, people are not two-thirds one thing and the remainder something else. This is a quote from him. He said, temperament, personality, or outlook don't divide quite like that. Um, you end up a funny homogeneous mixture, and and he goes on to say, this is um, Kazuo Ishiguro. This is something that will become more common in the latter part of this century. People with mixed cultural backgrounds and mixed racial backgrounds. That's the way the world is going. Um, I don't think that's controversial at this point. Um, I think that's a commonly accepted wisdom, and I think that Derek Walcott's poetry shows that that future world can be beautiful, ordered, and essentially okay. The, the fact that he's achieved it in verse is what, as a, for me as a poet, is the single greatest um, affirmation that it's possible in the world. And that's what poetry is capable of at, at, its, at its most um, uh, 
fulfillment. And, and that's what Derek Walcott's verse says to me. So here's a passage from Omeros. It, it, it's taken reasonably at random. It's a rather long and complex work. It not only goes back in um, literal history, but it goes back in um, spiritual history as well, all the way back to the before time in Africa. You know, Achille uh, gets set afloat on his uh, rope, on his canoe, and he ends up in the before time in Africa, and he discovers for the first time who he is and his name and his tribal roots and all of that. It's a fascinating work. It just unlocks in every direction and encompasses all of us eventually. Um, anyway, here's one small passage just to give you a taste of it. Yeah, it's turned on. It just takes a minute to warm up. <laughs> no, I didn't. I haven't turned it on yet, so. Oh, okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, this is from book two, chapter 14, and it's a little bit of Dutch history. There is an English spy who's sent uh, back, sent to uh, the Netherlands to take note of their shipping um, details. And here he is just arriving. He's very tired. Um, he's he's uh, fresh off the boat, and he's put in a coach uh, with a Dutchman, and he hates the Dutch. You know, because that's his job, to hate the Dutch. Uh, that's good enough. The midshipman swayed in the coach, trying to read. He knew that the way to fortify character was by language and observation. The Dutch rode, striped with long poplar shadows in the late afternoon, the weight of the man in his coach, a sunbeam changing sides on the cushion, a spire's fish hook luring a low shoal of clouds like silvery bream towards it, the light gilding the spine of his book, the stale smell of canals and the red thatched farmer who glowered and swung like a lantern on the seat opposite with the marsh breath of an embalmer, a wire coop of white chickens beneath his feet, each boot as capacious as those barges crossing the lowland reaches at dusk. Um, that's one sentence, if you notice. Oh, sorry, two sentences. The first line is one sentence. Um, and then the rest is one sentence. And this is orchestrated more like a symphony than a sentence. Um, it's orchestrated by the poetic music of it. Notice how he knew that the way to fortify character was by language and observation, colon, the Dutch road. So that's a commentary on the Dutch way being through rationality, through study, through language and observation. But then using the poetic tool of the line break, the Dutch road, he then continues the sentence quite smoothly to give it a totally second meaning. The Dutch road striped with long poplar shadows. That's no longer a statement of you know Dutch philosophy. That's the actual road. And then he doesn't stop for another 10 lines, he describes the road and traveling on it. Um, Derek was fond of quoting Nijinsky, actually slightly misquoting Nijinsky in an interview uh, about how, he, how his uh, success was as a dancer. Nijinsky didn't exactly say this, I now know, but um, it was very close. Uh, when asked what was the secret to his success, Nijinsky said, when I go up, I stay up. And here we have Derek Walcott when he goes up the Dutch road. Now you could end the sentence right there and you'd have terrific, you know, pro uh, uh, poetry. But here he goes up and then he stays up. The Dutch road striped with long poplar shadows and lantern. And then we have the beginning of this scene, which continues for another uh, 20 stanzas or so, just riding in this coach with this Dutch man. The Dutchman is a throwaway character. He's a, just a stock <coughs> character. He's only in this little scene and nowhere else. And what's more, he's a hated figure by the man whose perspective we're seeing, which we learn later on is Rob Nathus, I believe his name is, the spy, the English spy, who's next to this Dutch character. And yet, we see this Dutch character painted with such <coughs> compassion, with such dignity. He is rendered the Dutch peasant you know, almost like a Rembrandt painting of a Dutch peasant. And in fact, Derek uses all of the tropes of, of high Dutch uh, visual arts in describing playfully um, this Dutch peasant. His, his, his use of humor is 
uh, through the roof, amazing and consistent. And the care with which he paints even this minor stock character, it's like a Bruegel, it's like a Rembrandt. I mean, we don't have anything like this in English literature. And it's, it's an astonishment like this, on this micro level, for 300 pages, and always different, and always new, always fresh, and always um, an astonishment. So I can say, if you want uh, a taste of what we are most capable of as a poetic civilization, um, read Omeros, and read it with an open heart and an open mind. And um, <coughs> I, to me, it means we have a possible future as a humanity. That's, um, that's the significance of what Derek has done. For me as a poet, it certainly had that influence on me. Um, and uh, so many of the issues that we're only now, 30 years later, sort of coming around to are already fully present and fully addressed in almost things like environmental concerns, um, certain ways of looking at the races that we are now coming around to. So um, it's just uh, surprising in many ways. Um, I'll stop talking now, but I'm happy to engage in any conversation on any of these topics that I raised or anything. <laughs> Thank you for an interesting talk. You mentioned the importance of form for Walcott, like the hexameter line, right, which he sort of introduced or reintroduced and made work in English. And I'm just curious, as a teacher of poetry, did he uh, dwell on that aspect? Did you make you write poems in various traditional meters? And, and in general, could you say a little bit more what he was like as a teacher? I'd be curious. Okay, yeah. Um, I'll say some gratuitous stuff and I'll say some relevant stuff. Um, Derek had a very, very fixed set of lessons and they were very strongly echoing the concerns that he was working out in his own oeuvre at that time. So it shifted slowly over time. I was very privileged to have sat in his seminar completely a second time, and then, amazingly, a third time. Um, sometimes he lets students sit in a second time for a second year. Um, I don't know of any other case where he's let a student sit in for a third year. Maybe he didn't remember me or something. Um, but so I, I was able to attend these lectures, and they were very often, year after year, the same lecture, but I could see the slight variation and how it mirrored where he had come to in his thinking. So he spoke a lot about other poets that he admired, and you can see a lot of them in here. For example, I mean, you know, if you look at uh, a line like, a spire's fish hook luring a low shoal of clouds like silvery bream, you can, you can hear an echo maybe of um, uh, a brackish reach of shoal off Madiket, you know, from, uh, from Robert, uh, oh gosh, uh, from the mid 20th century uh, New England poet. Robert Lowell. Yeah, Robert Lowell. thank you, Robert Lowell. A brackish reach of shoal off Madiket. Um, it's very, Derek uh, would lecture on Robert Lowell, he'd lecture on um, Yeats, he'd lecture on other writers, all of whom I hear echoes of in his work, but not just echoes, but also what they achieved and how it made our work possible. So I very strongly had a sense that he was not just working in a vacuum, but he felt he needed to give us these lessons so that there was also a community of people out here who could understand what he was doing and grappling with, and so there would be a, you know, a, a readership for, for what he was doing. Um, and he very strongly had a sense um, of, for himself of the value of what he was doing. I mean, a little facetiously, but true, if I wanted to summarize how he uh, presented himself on the first lesson, you know, it was something like um, sometimes an entire age can be wrong in its poetics and it takes a great man to come along and say what's wrong. <coughs> and then two, our age is wrong in its poetics, here's what's wrong. And then spending the rest of the semester basically answering that question. So um, I had a very strong sense that he was tying us to a tradition that had slipped away because it had not been maintained and updated. But now he was giving that the fullness of presentness by infusing it with all of the things that are important to us. And that not only updated it, it made it one cycle later 
um, the only <coughs> suitable vehicle because of its expansiveness to contain all of these complex concerns and to unify them and to give them a certain coherence. And that's uh, my sense of his use of hexameters. He's, he's not using dactylic hexameters strictly, um, but every line does have a rhyme nearby. Notice they're also in triplets like Dante's Inferno, but they're not, trip, they're not rhyme triplets the way the Inferno is. So he's making a nod to both of these sources, I think, both Homer and Dante, in, um, in laying out Omeros in this form. And I strongly feel that Derek himself felt that the, the line, the lineage was from Chaucer to Shakespeare to Milton to James Joyce. And um, so we did talk a lot about those influences in, in his work. Yes? Yeah, yeah uh, maybe you can talk a little bit more about uh, hexameters. All right. Um, I'm looking for some. Right. And um, I'm not finding them. Like, but, like Surya yeah, is a. Hex, I mean, when we talk about a hexameter, right, we, we think of a six foot <coughs> dactylic line. It's not dactylic. Right. Okay. It's six. It's six feet, but it's not dactylic, and that's that. It's like what Surrey managed to do with the Aeneid. It's blank hexameter. Um, that's as far as Surrey got as well. And Longfellow too wasn't using dactyls. So hexameter in English has never meant true heroic, uh, you know, or dactylic uh, hexameter. Uh, for better or worse, the languages aren't that closely correspondent. Um, okay, however, so it's hexameter in the sense of being a six feet line. That's as far as Derek uh, took it. Okay. All right. I mean, that's that's a that's a rather different claim, right, from the sort of um, uh, revived classicism. I, I, I won't. Mean, I won't. Uh, because I mean, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot of mid-century experimentation of the role and invention of the music of Fisher and others, right, uh, you know, variable feet within within one. I I um, I, I I agree with you. Okay. And, but we can see that Elizabeth Bishop stopped at the level of experimentation. Her, her work is exciting, but has a little value beyond that. When you go back and forth in fifth time, you're not going to get deeper levels of uh, subtlety and uh, insinuation and all of that. She was, she was strictly at the level of experimenting with those. Um, Lowell is something different. Uh, Lowell is, has that depth. Um, but I believe that what Derek Walcott has added to this is not a revival of hexameter, it's a transformation. Just as he has taken the Homeric themes, and he has taken those characters, and he's removed the glory of battle. There is a battle scene in Homeros, so the, the Dutch fighting in the Antilles in the 1700s, but, but it's not emphasized. And for the most part, all of the Homeric guts and glory, all of the, the value in, in vanquishing and, and valor and all of that, which forms the backbone of the Homeric value set, is totally transformed into ordinary people living their extraordinary lives in very small, incessant interactions. Um, so I don't feel it's a revival of hexameter, I feel it's a transformation suitable to a new age of values, and that blank hexameter is, a, is the empty enough vessel that Derek found uh, was complex and, and big enough to be able to start to fill with this new age of, of values. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you for your amazing introduction to <coughs> Walcott. Uh, I'm just curious, correct me if I'm mistaken. Uh, I would very much like to uh, grasp the idea of this natural hexameter, which you mentioned. Uh, first of all, do you use it in your own uh, verses, in your own writings? And uh, second, uh, here in this uh, fragment, uh, we see alternating rhymes. And rhyming uh, actually was, uh, was not Homeric hexameter, right? Homeric did not rhyme his uh, verses. Uh, and uh, uh, by natural hexameter, do you mean that rhyming for contemporary English language poetry is also natural? This is my question. One big influence for Derek, whom I haven't mentioned, is W.H. Auden. And Auden really did the work in the 20th century, which I feel is most closely preparatory to Derek being able to do what he did. And um, Derek's advice with Auden was unconditional. 
He said, read every scrap of Auden you can possibly lay your hands on, even though that was his advice about Auden. Um, Auden, for me, again, just speaking as a poet and not as a scholar, but speaking as a poet, for me, the achievement or an achievement of Auden is that he reinvigorates every form of English verse that he touched, which is most of them. Um, with a presentness and, a, and a, a readability and a contemporaneity. I won't, I won't say modernity because that's an odd word to use in a literary context. It means different things to different people. Autumn is not necessarily a, a modernist. But he, he brushed off all of the forms of English poetry and showed that they could be used um, with present naturalness, for lack of a better word. Um, and he, he, he really, I think, touched, looked at, tried just about every English verse form in existence that there is. So what Auden did was kind of polish off the language, purify the language and the, the forms, and show that the forms are still perfectly valid. You know, we can talk that way in English poetry. Um, Derek built on that by turning his ship forward, turning his prow uh, a bit forward and seeing where we are all sailing to and writing from that vision into the present and filling up his ship of lines um, with the, the, those waves of sea. Um, Derek was writing from the point of view of the Caribbean where it was not the weight of history that was entering the lines, it was the incessant waves of the sea. Um, and in that fragmentary yet rhythmic and beautiful way, he managed to encapsulate all of the things that he, he, he was grappling with and that we are grappling with as society. Ezra Pound tried something similar to shore up the fragments. Elliot, it's Eliot's phrase, but Pound tried to do it. And Pound considered what he had done as a failure. You know, he had a, a, a bag of, of, of ruins, you know, or whatever he, he said at the end. I mean, that's also a, a glib remark. You know, Pound's achievement was considerable. I, I'm a fan of what Ezra Pound achieved, but it's fragmented. Um, Derek is the first poet that I've seen that has tried to weave it together into a narrative harmony, a unity, a, 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 a expansive <coughs> utterance that has coherence and that has this dignity and this weight and this architecture that is built to last <coughs> through, the, uh, through the eons. You know. It's architected in a certain way that I don't detect in any other poet contemporaneous. Yeah. If I may, another question, sort of following up on Bob's question. I'm still trying to wrap my head around what is actually what makes these hexometers. One thing I noticed, at least with the sample you have up there, every single line has exactly 12 syllables. Okay. So that could not be an accident. So it seems to be almost a syllabic concept of verse, which would make it akin to, let's say, the French Alexandra, which has exactly 12 syllables. Except that in the French Alexandra, you always have six and six. There has to be a Cesura in the middle. Yeah. He's, he's, he seems to almost stunningly avoid the Cesura. Right. Like in each line, you're looking for after six for a break, but it's never there. Yeah, so I, I think he's not avoiding Cesura so much as playing against the, the tension of the expectation of the right. Cesura to heighten it. And there's all these, you know, all these strong enjambments, you know, like after noon, so that the line flows over. Right. So very, sort of very much so. Um, this, what you're looking at here, is from an essay that I published on Omeros in uh, Open Letter, which is an online literary site. So if you want to, um, I, I can invite you to, it's the best expression that I've managed about the importance of Derek Walcott's achievement in Omeros from a poet's point of view. So this, this whole article, this, this um, essay that goes with this, um, is a poetic analysis of that verse that you just saw. And this, the name of this is um, Deus in Machina, Poetic Technique in Derek Walcott's Amaro. So if you want to look for that online, I welcome you to um, follow up. This is an essay that I wrote. Um, and it's, it's the, the only directly poetic analysis of Omeros that I know of. I've read a lot of stuff about um, Omeros' achievement, you know, socio sociologically or whatever, <laughs> um, but very little about the actual poetics. Um, I'm no expert at all, at all, about hexameters, um, so there's not a lot of that in here. But anyway, it does put some more meat on the, on the skeleton of what I'm trying to present here, so I can certainly welcome you to, to take a look there. 
Um, to address your question earlier, do, have I have I specifically been experimenting with hexameters? Um, up until recently, no. Um, but I did feel empowered to invent uh, and stick with formal form um, suitable to material that I was looking at. So I developed a nine syllable line where I was writing a sort of mini epic uh, inspired by some of what I have learned from Derek or lived through from, from knowing Derek's work. Um, I have experimented with hexameter. It is, therefore, I know, um, still as difficult as it ever has been. Um, but I'm trying to implement this realization that if there's a suitable amount of complexity, and honestly, I have no other way to explain it than compassion, um, then somehow a new kind of hexameter is suitable. And, and we're up to that level. We're up to that expansiveness again in English. Um, but that's as far as I've got. Yeah, I can't really speak scholarly in a scholarly fashion. I had a question, and that was, you know, when, I'm, when I teach Derek Walcott and when I read Derek Walcott, I'm always struck by how thoroughly he seems to um, have really imbibed, uncynically, <laughs> uh, a lot of his education in this um, very colonial, very anglophone um, type of setting. So as you see him commenting uh, consistently, of course, in Omeros, on not just, or not maybe exactly, Greek epic, but in the Western humanistic tradition of what Greek ep epic is supposed to be. <coughs> is what I see him commenting on in other poems, of course, he comments about other major Western new, uh, institutions like the United Nations and things like that. And I'm wondering if he did that, it sounds like, also in his teaching, if he's telling you to read Auden, if he's telling you to read these kinds of things. Where did he point to, or did he point to things beyond um, kind of a, a European and Anglophone heavy tradition as places to go for Poetic knowledge, insight, learning. Um, <coughs> no, not to my memory. Um, Isn't that probably, <laughs> probably here and there, possibly. <coughs> there. Um, Derek was reconciling or uniting specific traditions, mm -hmm. but in a Caribbean context, there were a lot of them, and so there is a very, very strong African influence. Um, and African-related themes, historical, in terms of social justice, in terms of the present uh, world and, and racial tensions and, and all of the things that we're working out in a post-colonial context in his work, in his essays, um, but not so much in his teaching. As a, as a poetry teacher, he was teaching us poetics and not um, responsible philosophical thought. So but not at the language of form, even, right? He's not... He did include patois in his uh, in his in much of his verse. You know, even he did whole um, theater pieces, whole plays mm -hmm. in uh, in patois or corresponding um, dialect. Um, and he was heavily influenced by the fact of there being such a strong and yet so also so strongly erased African heritage on the Caribbean, mm -hmm. that the slaves came over and started out as slaves, as tabula rasa, or whatever the plural of rasa is, tabulae rasa, rasa, mm -hmm. something like this, um, that, they, uh, that, that it's only, you know, in, in, in contemporary times that uh, the notion of what were we, what are we, what's our name, you know, has, mm -hmm. has come up again since the 70s, maybe 60s, late 60s, uh, mm -hmm. certainly by the mid-70s. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's the world with, that Derek is inheriting, and that's the conversation he's inherited. So it's a, it's a major concern of his, but not, again, not in a scholarly way, but just because that's his received um, culture that he's living in and living from. So what was his response, or did he, did he articulate a response to things like um, Aimé Césaire and Negritude, um, other kinds of, you know, even things like the Harlem Renaissance? I mean, was that part of his poetic vernacular or his, his wheelhouse of things that he was talking about or just was that not? Um, I'll have to get back to you on that. I, do, I can't say that I can answer that mm -hmm. uh, adequately. Sure. Okay. Other questions? All right. Let's give a, a final thank you.